So where we're headed today with a digital storytelling, let me offer some um, truth in advertising. Um, this will not be a class on the how to's for creating a digital story or the or the actual mechanics of it. Our time constraints just don't allow for that. Don't don't leave us. <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned and stay logged in because we will still have, I think, a very worthwhile discussion about digital storytelling. And as Lacey said, um, she said about herself, this was not a term familiar to her. Maybe it's not a term familiar to some of you. So we do want to talk about what it means, um, the importance of storytelling, whether it's traditional or done digitally. We'll talk about the elements of good storytelling and the steps that Becky and I have um, kind of distilled um, for you today. There's a great deal of information about digital storytelling out on the web. Um, it made this class kind of challenging to put together because there's so much information out there. And thanks to Becky, you will soon be in a receipt of a wonderful handout that will hook you up with some wonderful digital tools and resources that we hope you will want to explore on your own. So that's where we're headed with our discussion. We always like to um, give, an, give this um, connection to our standards program wherever it um, appropriately connects with our education topics and with nearly every education topic we provide, there's typically a connection to standards and that's true with storytelling as well. If you look to the standards manual, you'll see in chapter seven that those standards are all about library programming and community relations. So standard 69 calls for the library to promote its collections and services by using a variety of approaches to publicity. Our traditional favorites certainly fit in there, summarizing your library's annual report for various audiences creating bookmarks and flyers, maybe even newsletters are all great approaches to library publicity. And we will put forward that now digital storytelling will be a new approach to library publicity. Um, standard number 70 there calls for the library to develop community relations through regular communication with city council members, with the business community, with parents and patrons. Um, again, those communication of channels can take a lot of a lot of different paths, but we again would like you to think in terms of after today in terms of maybe thinking about digital storytelling as a fresh way to tell some of your library's um, stories and certainly your success stories. So there are connections to standards. Um, we should, we, we really should kind of next go into um, looking at some, some definitions, both of traditional stories, and then we'll talk a bit about definitions behind digital storytelling. So I do always like to start out with kind of a, a definition, and I think the best way to look at this one is to sort of take apart those two words, digital and storytelling. So I have been interested in storytelling basically my whole career. I started out, many of you know, in theater, and that sort of led naturally into storytelling. So I've been gathering information about storytelling for a long time, and I really think that's at the heart of this, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. So what do we mean by storytelling? Um, to tell stories is fundamentally human. The, the words connotation obviously suggests sort of that classical or that folk model of storytelling, but it's so much larger than that. It really is some kind of a speaker engaging their audience through some kind of narrative. So that's sort of the essence of the of the idea of storytelling. I found these quotes um, out there and I, I really liked, um, hopefully you're looking at some of those as I'm talking here. What I found interesting was between the three of these, they they really hit on two 
really important points. Um, the first one you can see in at least two of these, they talk about open hearts and open minds. And I thought, what a cool thing that stories can do is opening our hearts and opening our minds and then thinking about that in terms of libraries. What are we trying to change with the stories that we tell at libraries? And then the second big piece of these, um, all three of these actually, are stories can help lead us into action. We can change the world with stories. And again, we think about that in terms of libraries and how is it that we want to if it's not change the world, change our community. So that I think is a really good introduction into um, storytelling and why it's important. So now I'm gonna let Bonnie take this one, but you know, we talked about ways that we could talk about what storytelling is and um, we both think Jamie can do it a lot better than we can. So I'm gonna hand it over. Yes, yes. With, without, without a doubt, at least I'll speak for myself on that one. Um, Becky and I both share a fondness for Jamie LaRue. In fact, I will, I will confess to um, maybe a greater fondness, actually. I've been crushing on this guy um, for years, and I will say when he sported um, long curly hair, he was a ringer for George Carlin. So there you go. That's another explanation. Um, Jamie is currently the director of ALA's Intellectual Freedom Office, and he is a master storyteller, um, mostly because he he is a master public speaker. We have heard him so many times over the years, and we wanted to include this video clip because it's such a good illustration of the elements of a well-told story, whether it's a traditional story, as he will, as he will um, explain, or whether it becomes a digital story, he's going to put forth the elements of what makes a well-told story. And you don't have to scramble to write down um, his, his uh, six points. We have that coming up on a follow-up slide. It's a fairly long clip. We won't play the whole thing, so you won't actually hear the story about this little boy named Caden, but we really would encourage you to find this on YouTube and um, play Jamie's clip in its entirety so you can hear the actual story about Caden. You'll get the gist of it though when we show you just this part of the video. This is how we tell a library story. And let's break this down again. How does it begin? Give me a real person. Not just a situation, not we serve teenagers, we serve senior citizens, we serve children. Caden was three years old, specific. Then give me a problem. That's the hook of the story. Caden stutters. That's the issue, and that's what gets you emotionally invested in the story. Then introduce library as supporting character, not the main character. Library, what do we do to intervene to assist with this? We have a program where you come and read the docs. And then give me one fact to ground the story. So I know you're not just making it up. And if I say many, many libraries around the country provide programs for dogs, I say, yeah, okay, that's reasonable. I, I believe that. And the last thing is, as a preacher friend of mine used to say, give them the phrase that pays. Give them a, a short, succinct, memorable phrase that will carry that message home. And so note again that this is the process through which we don't just keep people entertained, we're establishing a, a message of value and we're doing it in a way that changes people's minds. Not by pummeling them with facts, which is the library tendency. Come in and say, here's all of the information and once you know the information, you'll change your mind. Information doesn't change people's minds. Stories do. So the, the two um, points that um, really struck me in this clip was that information and facts don't necessarily change people's minds, stories do. And the other point he made, which, which was surprising and I think something that so many of us would think very logically that this library is going to be the lead player. But as he instructs us, 
The library should not be the lead player. The library needs to be the supporting player. The library steps into the story to explain how library service can impact someone's life, how the library service or a program or assistance with something um, became an intervention and led to a happy ending. So on this slide, what we've given you are Jamie LaRue's six elements of storytelling, starting the story with a real person who has a real problem. The library steps in, there's a happy ending, a, certainly putting forward a fact and then the fair phrase that pays. So as you look at this, what we would kind of like you to think about in your own library setting is, do you have um, can you know and you can add this in chat if you would like to or just think about it you maybe can't come up with a real person with a real problem um just right off the bat but think about that as we go through the rest of this webinar and as you go on after today to think about doing more with digital storytelling incorporating these elements by beginning with a real person with a real problem i think will be a great way to um, begin thinking about this so we've talked about traditional stories, um, traditional story definitions, but what we would like you to um, share with us in chat at this point is what do you think of when you hear the phrase digital storytelling? How do you think in inserting digital changes um, the flavor of storytelling? How does it change the the focus and the formatting of it. Go ahead and, and give us your thoughts in chat. It's a quiet bunch today and we do have some thoughts on this as well. We'll talk a little bit about what digital does when we when we add that into it yep we're ready we're ready for our explanation yeah here come here here they come here come um some yeah absolutely um good commentary it's it is it's definitely more visual um public speaking is wonderful we love it becky and i we're going to make that one of the installments in this series but um, and that and that's visual when you're up in front of an audience, but it does lend a visual component to your storytelling um, and often movement as well um, in a way maybe that a static printed page does not. So visual, absolutely. Infographics um, give you that visual component as well. Using technology, yep, absolutely. photos, social media, yep, all of those can factor in. All right, then let's go ahead and move on. If anybody else has more um, that you want to talk about, go ahead and throw that up in the chat. Um, but otherwise, let's take a look at some of the definitions that we found. There's one um, up here on the screen. The other thing you can see in the, the bottom right corner there is this is just one of many ways that we found to tell a digital story. And we're gonna go into that in a little bit more detail in a second. But one of the other definitions, besides the one that's on the screen here, one that we found talks about um, digital stories usually contain some mixture and it you know, typically computer-based images. It might have some text, um, maybe some recorded audio, some narration. It may have video clips and it may have music. Digital stories can vary in length. Um, I've got lots of information I found as I was out sort of digging around. You will find um, a variety of pieces of advice. Um, one of the ones that I found that I think I'm going to talk about in a second here talks about how many, if you're doing it as a slide that you're turning into a video, it talks about 50 to 60 slides. But there's, so there's lots of advice out there. Use what works best for you. Here's another definition that I found that I really liked, and it says digital storytelling is the practice of combining narrative 
with digital content, which includes images, sound, and video. Now, this one says to, to create a short movie, but I would like to posit that there's other ways. It, digital storytelling does not have to be a movie. There are other types of digital storytelling, I think. Typically, it says it has a strong emotional component, and I think if you go back to that, what is storytelling, you'll see that that emotional piece is, is also in there. Um, really sophisticated digital stories can be interactive movies. They may have really highly produced audio and visual effects, but typically it's a set of slides with corresponding narration or music, and that's what they uh, talk about. But I would like to suggest things like a podcast. Um, that is certainly digital. Um, we've, we've recorded it. We may have added music to it. We may have a live audience for, for a podcast. And it can be out there that people can use at any time when they're listening to it. So I really think, um, and we're going to talk about a podcast in a little bit here, but I really think podcasts can also be a type of digital story as well as um, some of the social media. And that was one of the things that, that somebody mentioned in there. Things like Instagram. When you think about putting up even just those short little videos that you can post in Instagram, that is a form of digital story. So it doesn't have to be this big, you know, two to five minute video that we think of when we think of it. You know, think of it in a little bit broader terms um, than that. Um, let's see. I think we are ready. This is Bonnie's favorite. So while she's talking and introducing this, I'm going to go ahead and get this queued up and ready to go. We have another video for you here. Oh, yeah, this is one of my favorites. I saw this for the first time at an ARSL conference, actually, when I went to a session on digital storytelling. And this clip got me hooked because it is such a great example and will make all of you wish that um, probably that you were um, a watercolor artist. It's a really creative example of a digital story. And it comes from a library. Yeah. I forget, Becky. It's a treehouse. Sorry about that. It comes from the Pleasant Hill Library. And I think in California. Uh, I don't know. I think. Anyway. All right, we ready? Yep. Okay. It's a tree house. I don't know if you had a tree house when you were a kid. Mine was really just a few boards nailed into an elm. But that didn't matter at all to me because that tree house was the most special, secret, magical place in the world. You climb up there and it's like a different planet or a castle or an invisible realm. And the only rules are the ones you make up. But it's just a bunch of two by fours and still, still it's a magical place because you make it so. I think libraries are like that. All the shelves of books are just two by fours unless you bring your own daydreams. My name is Patrick Reamer. I'm the Senior Community Library Manager at the Pleasant Hill Library. Sorry about that. It just it starts right up there. Let me go back in here. So it, that really is such a good example of digital storytelling. And if you are not um, an expert watercolorist, um, who is? Might there be someone in your community who could replicate something like this? Not this exactly, but could replicate some other kind of um, idea about what the library means to that person and, and just take a stab at seeing if someone could actually um, actually do a, a rendering like this, a drawing like this with a voiceover narration. All right, so next I want to kind of come back to that idea of storytelling and why it's so important. If you've been following library literature at all in the last, I don't know, five years, digital storytelling has really sort of come into its own. It's sort of a buzzword that we hear um, a lot about. So why this new emphasis on it? And I think Jamie alluded to this just a little bit. Um, but I've, I've got a couple of quotes here. So we really want to be able to paint a picture in the minds of something uh, of, that is really evocative of why your work matters. What is it that you're doing at the library that matters to people? Um, numbers don't matter. 
there's research that that's out there that um, talks about that. It's really the story behind those numbers that's important, and the the research really supports that. There's a psychological process that that happens in our brains when you start to talk in big numbers. The human mind just sort of goes into abstraction, and we kind of disconnect. They truly have done studies, and um, people donate when there's a picture of a single human being in front of them and we're told the story of that single human being the moment it turns into 10 people a hundred people a million people our brain sort of turns into that abstraction and we actually start to care less at that point which uh, to me that was just fascinating to find out that there's actual research done um, but it's how the human brain is wired and I think about that when I when I think back this is something that I've thought about a, a lot back in 2004 if you remember we had the right around Christmas there was a huge tsunami that happened loss of 230,000 lives that was so overwhelming to people I mean we don't hear about that anymore. Um, I'm not sure that most of us even remembered. I had to go and look it up. I knew it was a lot. 230,000. That number was so overwhelming that we have almost kind of put it out of our, our, out of our minds. What you may remember are those pictures and those stories of the individuals. The one that I recall is that train that was flipped upside down and the, the, the fact that the entire um, population of that train was just gone. And we saw pictures of that and the people on the top of that. So again, I think it just goes to show why this is so important in libraries is, you know, we're really good at doing numbers and, and we've always been good at doing numbers, but here's why this is important. Um, we showed this when we did the overview and I've told this story a couple of times. So some of you who have been in some presentations in Southeast have probably heard this before, but um, Denise at Tipton, the library director there, went to her city council and she was trying to get um, to, to sort of prime them for the fact that they're running out of space at their library. So she took a bunch of pictures during the course of the summer of the kids jam packed into the rooms. And in fact, they weren't even at the library. They were at a space next door that was packed even. Um, they couldn't fit in the library, went next door and even that was packed. And she went to her funders and she said, all right, so if a picture is worth a thousand words, then what is a video worth? And she actually strung together all of those pictures from the summer of the kids having fun and being crowded. And that's all she did with them. And I like this picture as well. This is one that I found in another presentation. You know, what does this picture on the screen say to you about you know what those road builders do and that's why pictures and videos can be so important um, talking to your funders looking at library reports to talk to them about how effective your program is think back to what we just saw where we heard that it's not the numbers you know jamie told us that we heard about that in the the studies on the brain it's not the numbers it's that human connection that really um, changes our mind so, you know, that's sort of a storytelling thing. So now we want to talk about a digital storytelling again. Really, digital storytelling is just the latest iteration of that narrative tradition. It can have lots of uses. Um, it's a way to convey our message. And you'll see this isn't just a library thing. Digital storytelling is being used a lot in education. Um, in fact, that was one of the things I found the most when I started researching this. Higher ed as well as K-12 education education is really getting into digital storytelling. So, you know, we're going to have kids coming out who understand, we know they understand how to use the technology, but now they're going to be understanding um, storytelling and they're going to be expecting that as we're, you know, as they're coming into their own and we're asking them to help with something or to fund with something as they're sitting on city councils. So this is something that we, we want to start thinking about now and how can we use it. Um, it's being, like I said, being used in education, sales. It's huge in sales right now. You'll see lots of um, examples on the web of how they're using it in sales. Journalism is also, think about the way traditional newspapers have changed and they have that digital component now. Digital storytelling is really prevalent in journalism as well. Marketing certainly, um, and the nonprofit world has really just gotten into it and using it in fundraising. So there's three pieces to digital storytelling that I think will sort of help 
pull together what this is. We talk about digital storytelling for advocacy. We're also going to talk about it for education and information. And then the third piece is communication and engagement. And those are all sort of distinct excuse me, distinct uses of uh, digital storytelling. So we're going to talk first about advocacy. And the um, Loida Garcia Fibo from uh, the, ALA, the new ALA, ALA president has introduced this new My Library, My Story. Hang on just a second here. I'm going to mute. That's what I get for talking so much. I need to flip back and forth with Bonnie a little bit more here. So a quote that she has that I think is really cool. She says, storytelling promotes goodwill. These new resources are for advocates to tell their stories even more effectively and then to translate that goodwill into support for libraries. And especially going back to what we talked about earlier in those quotes, especially concrete action on the part of elected leaders, community influencers, and our patrons. And so that's how these library stories can really um, key into advocacy. And a little bit later, we're going to take a look at um, the Libraries Transform, which is a really good example of using digital storytelling for, for advocacy. Another one that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on here um, really came from the, the education field, like I said, either higher ed or, or K-12. But digital storytelling, the reason they're using it so much in education, it really helps build skills that are relevant to the 21st century. And We talk a lot about 21st century skills and how can libraries be part of that. Um, some of those skills are, you know, reading and writing and computer skills. It's creative and creativity is one of those 21st century skills. And because it involves telling the story, it also develops communication skills. So um, we can use it as librarians to, to, you know, teach people about things. You're teaching a class on how to use bridges. We can use digital storytelling for that. And in fact, you probably are doing it right now already. When somebody comes in, if it's something you're not totally comfortable with, you can point them to the OverDrive website and say, they've got a video on this. That's a form of digital storytelling where we're really looking at information or educating or changing um, the skill level of somebody that's out there. But we can also talk about this in terms of teaching our patrons how to use those 21st century skills and by helping them create digital stories in their their personal lives. I think of things like the storytelling that takes place when families get together. What if we had a class on, you know, how to take some of those stories and turn them into something digital? I did something like this for, for my mom who had a, a 50th class reunion and they all sent in pictures and we put them together and added some music and some captions and just showed this little video clip um, to those women as they got back together from their, their nursing school days. So that's a class that we could teach in our library, um, how to use those 21st century skills for our patrons. The third one then is communication and engagement, and Bonnie is going to take that one. Yes, well, you mentioned Libraries Transform, and you probably all know about this campaign from the Public Library Association and the American Library Association partnering together. It really has advocacy at its core, um, but it's also known for producing some pretty slick uh, communication pieces. I'll bet you've seen before these many, many, there's now dozens of these because statements our library matters because, I love my library because, right? Um, you can buy a lot of those because statements for your library. You can buy them already commercially printed from the Libraries Transform website, or you could um, download them and print them uh, your own. And I think those would be a really nice communication pieces to have available during National Library Week, for instance. Um, the, the booklet you see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, every year in August, ALA produces a year in review of how Libraries Transform has impacted uh, libraries across the country. 
And so it comes out in August every year. This is from August of uh, 2018. It's, so this is the newest version. Um, but one thing that this 2018 report tells us is that in 2018, Libraries Transform created a new family engagement toolkit online to create awareness of how libraries uh, support families and children's uh, reading and children's uh, literacy. And in 2018, Libraries Transform continued to develop more because statements. There are literally dozens of them on topics such as literacy, job preparedness, cybersecurity, and so much more. Um, Libraries Transform is a great example of digital storytelling also. And the video clip we want to show you next comes from the uh, Pickering Public Library. I think that's in Ohio. And the reason we want to show you this, you guys, is because it uses those, um, those libraries transform because statements. And this is a video that Pickering Library decided they would ask their patrons to pick out some of their best um, because statements. And they, they hold them up and the library simply videotapes. This would be such an easy thing for practically any library to replicate that maybe this is where you want to begin um, your, you know, your uh, stepping in to creating some digital stories. So Becky, I'll let you um, play us this clip. That's another one of my another one of my favorite examples. I think that would be a really pretty easy thing to replicate at your libraries. Again, you can you could grab a hold of the commercially produced because statements. I think it would be even more fun to ask your patrons who would be willing to be filmed holding up their sign to come up with their own because I love my library because statement. Um, and what an effective story to be able to share with funders, with councils and supervisors, with your foundation and friends group. All right. And let us know any questions or any reactions to um, these examples. Um, all of these you will be able to revisit in the, in the um, slides and in the um, recording for today. So we want to um, get a little bit more specific now about um, digital uh, storytelling and we want to set the stage and kind of lead us into some steps that you need to that you'll need to think about if you begin to explore this in more detail. I mentioned early on that um, we 
provided kind of a disclaimer at the beginning of our time today that this webinar was never intended to be a how-to for creating a digital story just because 90 minutes can't do that for us, but we will provide the resources, examples, and what we hope will be inspiration. Um, encouraging you to um, look into this further at your library. There has been so much material out there on the internet about digital storytelling. Just, you know, do a Google search and you'll be um, stunned by all of the results that come back. Um, there's so much material on the do's and the don'ts, the steps, the mechanics of digital storytelling. Um, what Becky and I did as we we're putting together this program is we looked for common ground. We looked for common advice amongst all of the resources um, we looked at. And so we kind of distilled what we found into these common threads and it's a little something we call our steps to digital story creation and so again you don't have to frantically write down these seven we're going to take each one of these in turn with some examples for each if we start the process by thinking about the intention behind your presentation, and that is true whether your presentation is going to be um, a publicly delivered um, speech or um, of some kind to council or supervisors, maybe to your friends group, um, whether it's pub whether it's a public speaking, whether it's a written report, whether it's a newsletter, the traditional storytelling and the digital storytelling have this common intersection. You think first about the intention. What's going to be the point? What's going to be, what's your purpose? Presentations can do a few things. And Becky alluded to this earlier too. Presentations can seek to change your audience understanding of something. So my example of that is I think we can all step into doing so much more uh, about taxpayer education when it comes to how the library is funded. That's a big, that's a big thing for me. And I think if we could do more presentations about how the library is funded that is bound to change people's understanding that the library really is not a free resource. It is a tax supported city service. So that could be one intention behind a presentation. Maybe you want to change the audience abilities and Becky mentioned that in terms of 21st century skills. Here's an idea for you. What if you guys put together a video at your library introducing the digital products, the um, online subscriptions that your library pays for that are quite often hidden from view because they're not something you can display on a shelf, right? But these are the electronic products that you guys subscribe to to better acquaint your community with the fact that your library has these subscriptions online and available 24-7. What about a video that would help people better understand that and consequently use the programs. If you wanted to change the audience action, if you want there to be a call for action, maybe you're ramping up to encourage your community to pass the 27 cent levy in November of this year. Maybe that's one of your projects. A digital story could go a long way toward bringing people that call to action, why you need them to get out to vote on the 27 cent levy. And then maybe you want to change the audience beliefs or their value system about why the library is such an important city service and that you could do pretty easily through that video clip we showed about the because statements. I love my library because. So think first about the intention. I think that really 
comes first and then you and your staff your your team at your library can start brainstorming how you would put this story together and what format would make the most sense to tell your story maybe it would be a public speech maybe it would be something you include in your newsletter maybe it's social media posting maybe it's a video clip Think back to Jamie LaRue's story that he told about Caden. He really had, he, essentially, what that story wanted to convey to the audience was, probably, that the library has a reading therapy dog program. Probably something maybe a lot of community members weren't aware of. They would never have occasion to use it. But the library wanted to get that story out there. So. You start with that premise, and then how would you tell it? You introduce Caden. You introduce his issue is stuttering. You then find a way to put those pieces together to come away with that happy ending and that library intervention. That's really all about scripting. And, and you know, there's there are formulas for this, and you would all be familiar with formula. There's formula literature out there for sure. I mean, from detective stories to westerns to um, chick lit. <laughs> if you are if you are a fan of um, Lifetime movies, like I am. I'm a big Lifetime movie junkie, I will say. You can, you just know that practically everyone has a formula, but there's something comforting about that, right? Your Lifetime movie starts with the introduction and introducing the characters and the environment, and then it moves into introducing the suspicious. Something's not quite right. There's kind of so weird, suspicious people. And then the plot thickens when the heroine realizes that these people surrounding her are really weird or they're not who they appear to be. You bring in the danger, you bring in the climactic moments, and then you bring in the resolution. It's all pretty much of a formula, but if you think in terms like that, I think your scripting kind of comes together and following Jamie's six elements of really good storytelling, your scripting comes together, I think, easier than, than you might think. I think our next slide comes back to podcasts and Becky mentioned how podcasts can be certainly a part of the digital storytelling world. Um, I wasn't, I'm not a big listener of podcasts, actually. Um, but I became aware of this website. It's called 99% Invisible. Um, because I'm not a big podcast listener, I wasn't aware of this website, but it is really cool. You can lose yourself here. You can lose some time here. Um, these podcasts are all about the thought that goes into the things we don't think about, unnoticed architecture and design around the world. What really, uh, what I found really cool about this screen grab was when I was looking at podcasts and I found this website, I discovered that there is an interview um, with the author Eric Kleinenberg, who is the author of Palaces for the People. That was a book we used in Big Ideas book discussions just uh, in May. And so there's an interview about the author here on this website. So this is just a, a way to say that podcasts can absolutely be a part of digital storytelling. And I think, Becky, you didn't you tell me that Dubuque Public does a lot with podcasts? They just, I'm not sure exactly how far they are. There's actually two places that do. Um, the first one is Dubuque actually put together a quiet room where they've purchased um, soundproofing for the room as well as microphones so that their public can come in and actually create podcasts right there. They've got editing tools there. It's part of their makerspace. Um, I mean, it's separate from the makerspace, but it's part of that that program that they have. So they are, are pr putting that out. They've just opened it and I haven't talked, so I don't know um, how well it's going over, how often it's being used, but it certainly will be available for their staff as well. The other one that I know does um, podcasts is North Liberty. They have their, um, used to be called Womb Storytime, and I can't remember what the name is, their Stork Storytime, I think. And they have really gotten into the um, 
prenatal piece of library use and storytelling and, and talking. And so they do a podcast, I believe once a week, where they invite people into the library to do this podcast to talk about um, for, for moms um, and maternity. So there's some really cool stuff going on there. And wouldn't you think too that, um, you know, for, for many years, and this, this was kind of an effort that started years ago, um, collecting oral histories from people in your community, especially, um, you know, World War II vets are, are um, departing from us um, pretty rapidly now. Um, but I know that years ago, libraries kind of got into that effort of capturing some of those oral history stories from their communities. And that's, that's just kind of another takeoff on this. And I think that goes back to when we talked talked about those three pieces and we talked about um, the education information but that community engagement it's it's a way to bring your community into the library and hear their stories you can use them for that where you gather the stories and then you know collate them and put them out for people but you can also use that to hear their stories about their community and um, talk about that and how can you use that as a, a library leader I thought that was kind of cool too so now we're going to head into sort of the nuts and bolts of some of this. And like Bonnie said, I, I, we, can't, we simply can't go into all of these. I would love to go out and play all day and show you all these cool sites that are out there, but we just don't have the time to do that. So I really am working on um, a very long handout that I intend to sort of group um, together with a lot of links to articles and, and um, other websites that you can use there. So in this next step, in order to create that digital storytelling, we've talked about this since the very beginning, you need to find those images, the videos, the music, all that kind of stuff. Where do you go? How do you find that? Um, are there sources that are for free? Are the sources that are for free worth it? Um, I don't know if any of you have had this happen, but when we were um, teaching Canva, people would talk about some of the free resources that were out there. And I had actually been to a couple of webinars where they talked about free resources. And you find out pretty quickly that, you know, there's 10 resources on that website that are free. But if you want the good stuff, you got to go in and pay. So to sort of help um, figure out which are the ones that are worth it, you're going to need to look at a lot of a lot of sites. And so we're going to put that together. Um, I also am going to, in that handout, I'm also going to touch a little bit on the ones that are fairly low cost. Um, Canva, I think you can purchase images and you know, they're 99 cents. So you need to take a look at, you know, what, what am I going to use this for and how professional does it need to be, I think. Um, the other thing that I learned that I want to talk really quickly about here, I'll talk about it a little bit later as well, and that is when I started looking for royalty-free, whether it was an image or a video or music, I learned very quickly, in my mind, royalty-free meant free. That's not what royalty-free means. There's a very distinct definition of that, and royalty-free is a type of music licensing that allows you to pay for the music license just once. So you buy it and then you can put it on your website and use it. So instead of paying royalties so that every time it's played, you have to pay for it, um, it's you purchase it once. And so that's what royalty free means. So don't make the mistake that I made of confusing that with free or copyright free. So this is a, a photo that I want to specifically make um, mention of, and that is NASA now has a media library that is just filled with images, sounds, and video that you are free to use however you want. I mean, you know, again, going back to Bonnie's point, um, NASA is funded through our tax dollars, and so they have made all of these images and videos available to the general public for free. Um, they've always offered some content, but they really just recently did the, the entire library. You can search on their website and, and pull things up, just like you might do it on Google. And again, they've got images, video, and audio files. Um, I liked this particular one because I'm always looking for backgrounds and the PowerPoints that I do, you know, pictures are nice, but sometimes you just need something more than just a plain blue background. And I, I really liked this one. I thought it was um, really cool. The other nice thing that NASA does is they tell you what this is. So even though I didn't write it down, I don't remember what it was. It actually tells you what nebula or something this, this is a photo of. So 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about images and fonts and icons because icons are another thing that I don't have the, the ability to, you know, draft some kind of an icon for something in my library, whether it's a, a particular image that I want to convey quickly. We can all go out and, you know, find the elevator buttons and, and those kinds of things, but there are actually places where you can get lots and lots of icons. Um, so a couple of the image places that I just want to point out, Flickr, when you go to Flickr, that's where, you know, we have all uploaded our, our pictures, you know, whether it's an organization that you belong to, a lot of families have done that. You can upload your, your images to Flickr and then have them sort of privately there, but it's um, also got very public photos. But you can actually search by the type of license. So if it's under Creative Commons, and again, I have a definition coming up a little bit later in the copyright section. If it's under Creative Commons, it's something that you can use usually with attribution on that. So Flickr is a good place and you can actually filter by that. So if you only want to look at photos that are under the Creative Commons license, you can do that. So I'm looking for a library photo that's available that I can use in my presentation. Um, Wikimedia Commons is another one. They are all public domain images, so you can use those for free. Um, most of these sites that I'm going to just, again, uh, mention really briefly have an actual page on their site that will explain to you how you can use those images, if you can use them for free, if they're paid, if you have to attribute. They've got some really good legal uh, information on there. So, you know, don't take at face value everything that I'm telling you here today. Um, but that's just know that those sites uh, have that. And of course, our favorite that Bonnie and I talk about a lot is Canva. Um, even if I'm not creating something in Canva, I actually go out, I look at some of their uh, fonts or their icons or some of the rest of it and I'll grab something and um, use it and pull it into another another uh, document that I'm that I'm writing. Um, Adobe has a stock place you can get the first 10 images for free so if you're just looking for something quick there you can grab 10 of them um, for free and then you know if you want to pay later you can. Um, video I'm going to talk about a little bit later. I see there are some chats coming up as somebody let's see. Uh, it's really hard to see chat when I'm sharing my Oh, screen. it's just me. Okay. I'm just kind of okay. um, summarizing some of your All right, resources. fabulous. Thank you. All right, then um, here's another couple that I wanted to, to show you here. New York Public Library has digitized, you know, nearly a million items out of their collection. And again, it's a database of images. Um, I believe there's also, yeah, they've got streaming video, they've got photographs, they've got maps. Check their website. Some are available. They're in the public domain and you can use them free of charge to, to put in some kind of a presentation. Some you can't. So again, check their website. But there are a lot of these digital collections out there now. Another one that I want to just sort of quickly highlight is our very own Iowa Heritage Digital Collection, which is a place where a lot of libraries and institutions have uploaded um, photos, some of which, again, are will be uh, free to use because they're in the public domain, some aren't. So we've got a page on ours that talks about whether or not you can use those images. But if you're looking for um, historical things, that's a great place to go to, to look. Like I said, the New York Public Library has one and we have one in our state as well. Um, there's a couple of other ones. I was looking for um, a variety of fonts and there's this uh, site called Font Squirrel and most of those are free, I believe. When you're looking for icons, there's one called The Noun Project, which has, I don't know, it's like a half a million um, icons that are out there that you can go. And then, oh shoot, I forgot the name of this one. The one in the bottom left-hand corner there um, is, this is just one series from that website of, uh, one collection of different kinds of logos. This is a whole collection of logos and brands. So yeah, you can go out to Google Images, but you might be pulling it from somebody else's, you know, you're looking for, well, I do this all the time with OverDrive. I'm looking for some OverDrive um, icons and I can go out to Google Images and find one, but it might not be in a good resolution. The colors might be a little off. It may be hanging out on somebody's website. And I'm always a little uncomfortable about that. Um, and yeah, sometimes you can go to the OverDrive site and, and pull some of those downs, but this is a place um, where they have done uh, Creative Commons and they have put all those icons up there. So if you're looking for 
um, you know, the edge icon or a, that folder that you see, I think that's a Microsoft one. Those are out there that you can use as you're putting together presentations. So sounds and music, again, I learned a lot as I was doing some, some research on here. And before I go into some of the um, sites that I, that I investigated, they actually had some really good um, information, I think, on this. So we want to use music in our presentations to kind of set the tone. Um, maybe it's just something you want in the background. Um, that Pickering one is, is certainly background music. You know, there's not words in that, but it's, it's um, very forward. It's very upbeat. And it's, a, to me, that music matches that, uh, what they're trying to get across there. It matches those images so well. If you think about another tone, you know, sort of a, a low energy one, that might not have fit quite as well, but you look at the smiles on those people's faces and that music, whether I like it or not, that music is very catchy and um, I hear it in my head all the time. Um, so think about that. Subtle music has sort of that calm atmosphere and if you have the right track, your, your audience might not even notice that it's there, but it still can affect them in very subtle ways. But then again, if your slideshow has a real high energy, a celebratory feel, you want to think about tracks that will engage your audience to feel that. Thinking about a steady drum line underneath that. Um, I think on one of the other, I think this the slide a couple back, Bonnie had the picture of the shark coming out of the, the shelving. And if you think about that, you know, when we think of shark movies and you hear that Jaws um, theme, you know, there's that dun, 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 that's a piece of how it makes us feel. We hear that and it immediately makes us go back to that movie and feel that. And that's what music can do um, when you add that in there. So you want to think about the pacing, if this is a, a fairly long one, you know, a 30 second or a minute long um, one, you know, pacing might not be as important unless you've got some real strong ones in there. But think about, you know, you want music that's gentle. Do you want it positive and bright? Do you want some pauses in there as you're, you know, trying to promote the image that's on screen? You might want to bring your music down and then bring it back up again. And again, we've talked a lot about tone, you know, powerful, engaging, gentle, reassuring. What is it that you're trying to get across there? And then some of these um, tips I actually got from a uh, uh, TED talk from a guy who was talking about how to do a sales pitch. And so that's where a lot of this come from, comes from. But he says, you know, if your presentation has a kick in the pants spirit, the right background music is going to accentuate that. Let your passion shine through. So I thought that was kind of an interesting when you're pitching to investors. And, you know, when you think about it, sometimes our patrons are our investors as well as our, our funders. So for video, I actually split this one by accident here, so I need to go back a little bit. Um, the, the one that's up here is called videvo, V-I-D-E-V-O.net. And again, you can search. These are free. The one that's in the left-hand corner there with the nine on it is actually just a very short video that counts down the little sphere sort of turns and rotates and it counts from 10 down to one and it might be something that you could download and put on your website and again you can see on these um, this one says free download but you can see on these if you have to attribute it um, this one the license says royalty free so you need to go and look up what that license information is if you want to put it on your website or incorporate it into a, a video but that was one of the best that that i actually found was that vid Vidivo or Vidvo. Um, YouTube is another place where you can go. Some of those are up there under the Creative Commons license. And so you can uh, find out what that licensing is and you can use some of those in your presentations or on your websites. But again, check out their um, legal part because they will tell you they're, they're very, they will be very clear on what you can use and what you can't. Um, Vimeo is another one that you can search by under Creative Commons. That's another way that you can uh, come up with those. Um, let's see if there was anything else. Pexels. I was actually going to talk about that when I was talking about images. I must have missed that one. And um, Pexels has both images as well as 
um, free stock videos that you can use. Pexels, I've, I've found, I've only used it a couple of times, but I really like that one. And Pixabay is another one that we, in fact, I think I learned about Pixabay when we were doing the Canva presentation. One of our participants came and told me. So again, all of these ones that I'm talking about right now are going to be in that handout. It is not done yet, but it will be by the time this gets out and on our website and then put into Moodle. That, that will also be there. So storyboarding is the next piece, and this might be a new term uh, for some of you. So I thought we really needed to kind of start with what's a storyboard. Basically, it's a sequence of drawings and or um, the actual script with some kind of direction and the dialogue. And it talks about the shots that are planned for a movie or a TV show. And so you've maybe heard about it in relation to that. Um, I think, um, oh, the Star Wars dude, always did very involved complicated he knew which way he wanted the camera to be focusing and storyboarded every single sequence and every single frame out before they started shooting we don't have to get quite that involved but it's really helpful to help you organize your your thoughts and like bonnie said it goes back to that intention and then your script the storyboarding can actually and i think this can go between you know maybe you grab your images first and then you storyboard maybe you storyboard first and then go out and grab your images it sort of depends on how you work when you're scripting and and doing your images and so you may flip back and forth between those a lot um there's a lot of advice out there i think i mentioned this earlier one of the ones that i said or that i read said engaging presentations that can be viewed in less than three minutes consist of 50 to 60 slides. That seemed like a lot of slides. Now I think that's when you're turning those slides into a movie because certainly when Bonnie and I do presentations, we don't have 50 to 60 slides for three minutes. But if you're turning it into a movie, that seems to make sense. Now this was a, a interesting one that I found. In order to keep your audience engaged, make sure that your clips are between 30 and 60 seconds long. 75% of viewers will watch a video of up to one minute in its, enti in its entirety. And so I, I was thinking about that and I looked at how, you know, when I see things come up on um, Facebook, if it's under a minute, I may watch it. Once it hits about a minute, I'm, I'm like 75% of those viewers and I stop. It's too long for me at that point. So when you're doing something, whether you're putting it in Instagram or on your Facebook, Think about that statistic. 75% of viewers are going to watch a, a video that's up to a minute long. So once you start thinking about, you know, are you trying to do an actual video or are you just trying to do something very short or are you trying to do just a, a couple of Instagram posts or maybe a series of Twitter posts, um, think about using storyboarding to sort of get that movement and that motion. So the storyboard then is going to actually help you put into order those images and then identify any missing images before you actually start the editing process. So to create a storyboard, just write on your script, just start, you know, take your script. Um, I think I read someplace 250 words is about a two to three minute video. So I thought that was a, a good piece of advice as well. Take those words and start saying, well, this would be a really cool image that I'd like to have here. And just start plopping that onto the page as you think about it. Um, put your images into order, write the corresponding number of your image onto the, to the script. And so now you've got your images and you've got your script that are starting to match up. Um, they really help us tell that story from start to finish. It's created in the order of the way things happen, and it helps us show what's going to, to happen when. Um, they can also, and I have found this a lot, and I think Bonnie can probably testify to that as well, when I'm putting things together in my PowerPoints, it can also help me think about the order. I look at it and I think, oh, that image doesn't quite fit with that. And so it, it's a really good way to help move that story forward. Um, the other thing that it can help you do as you're thinking about adding in music i think that's sort of the third piece to that what do you want the music to be saying at this point in your story so um i'm going to show the re this resource just a little bit later but both bonnie and i independently bought copies of this book by dan rome called show and tell and in 
pre preparing for this, I actually went through that. He also wrote, oh, Bonnie, you might have to help me. Something about the back of the napkin, I think, was one that he wrote. He's um, an artist and he does a lot of sketch work. So if you've seen those really short video clips of, of people sketching, that's, that's the type of work that he does. And then he talks about it a little bit. So in the very beginning of that book, he talks about how to make an extraordinary presentation. And he has three pieces of advice. Tell the truth, tell it with a story, and then tell that story with pictures. So that's his, his big thing, is the pictures that we're, we're using to tell the story. And he says, in order to illustrate any story, you only need six pictures. So we're gonna look at each of those sort of in turn. You need a who, you need a how much, you need a when, and then the next slide we'll have, we're going to need a where, a why, and a how. So if those are the elements that we need to, to tell that story, um, what what kinds of pictures or illustrations can we use? So if we're thinking about who, we're talking about people. So throw in portraits. You know, if you can sketch a portrait, great. If you've got a photo of somebody, great. If you've got a video of them telling their story, um, that's great too. So think about that who and including those pictures of, of people in there. If you're telling a certain kind of story, you wanna talk about how much. Charts and graphs are fabulous for that. Um, if you're telling another kind of story where the when is very important, think about timelines. I love this, this illustration here. Um, you know, it's a very short amount of time, but it's got things on the top and the bottom. It's got a mix of stories. I love the little um, tie-shaped one that's hanging down off of there. So there's lots of really interesting elements in this timeline. So the other three that we talked about then were where. Certainly we can include maps. Um, in, in our digital stories, if that's an important element of the story that you're trying to tell. And again, for a, a particular kind, you know, perhaps those education or information stories, we want to look at that how, and flowcharts are a really good way to do that, and the why. You might throw equations into there as well. Um, I think particularly if you're educating, as Bonnie said, about how libraries are funded, those equations can be really important and makes it more interesting than just putting the words uh, that are up there. So the next part that we're heading to, um, we called lights, camera, action, which I, I really like that as sort of a, a way to talk about the different tools that you're going to need. And for me, this is the hardest piece to sort of nail down, um, but it's also the one that I think people want the most. What do I need to buy? What do I need to borrow or have in order to make this thing? How am I going to get this product out there? So there's lots of tools that are available to make and share stories. It's not limited to any particular technology. Like I said, you know, we talk a lot about video, but certainly audio podcasts are another way to do that. Um, presentations, I think, are another way to do that, whether it's PowerPoint or Prezi or um, something else that Bonnie is going to clue you in on here in just a little bit. And I'm going to keep an eye on my time here. Um, sometimes all you need is a smartphone. Um, there might be free software apps that are out there. Really what you want to try to do is find that tool that matches the purpose of the project, the skill of the storyteller, the resources that you have available, and the needs of that target audience. So what I'm going to include in that handout that I have for you is some of the best articles that I found. So I have articles from CNET that reviews the best digital cameras. So if you're looking to go out and actually buy some equipment for this, that's an article you can look at and figure out, if I'm gonna buy a camera, what's gonna be the best for what I'm trying to do? Because again, that kind of information gets old really fast. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's why it's best to sort of keep up with that rather than, again, writing down everything. So the types of equipment that you're going to need, you might think about things like a green screen. Um, if you're if you're doing that, and I have seen several libraries, I think Bettendorf has, has bought a green screen and has a, a room where, where people can come in and do videos there. Um, iTalk is something that's an Apple product that is used for audio recording and editing. Certainly you can use your iPad or your phone. That's um, digital cameras, another one there. They do recommend tripods. Um, whether you're using your iPad or digital camera, it just helps make a more polished professional uh, um, 
product when you're when you're finished with that. And that one over there on the left, I really looked hard to find. You want to think about lighting and reflectors. Lighting in libraries is notoriously bad. So if you've got somebody back in a corner, um, think about investing in some kind of lighting and reflectors that that you can use to make those a little bit higher quality. And also the same with uh, microphones. You can buy some microphones now that you can plug into your iPad or into your computer or whatever it is that you're using to, to record with. So think about investing in, in some of those as well. I think the other thing that I didn't put a picture of here, but is really important, and I read this over and over, so I finally decided it must be important enough I need to talk about it. And that is, if you're doing video and audio, think about storage. Are you gonna keep this on a server? Are you gonna keep it on a particular, um, uh, computer that you have? Are you going to put it onto flash drives? And when you think about that, also think about how are you going to organize it? So before you go out and start, you know, grabbing all of these things, how are you going to name them? Come up with some kind of a convention. Is it going to be by the date? Is it going to be by the person? Is it going to be by the scene? Is it going to be descriptive? What's your folder structure going to look like? Because the worst thing that can happen is when you start to work on editing and putting this all together is, you know, you have the perfect interview, but you can't find it. And you got to go look through all 45 pieces that, that you've recorded. So think about that storage, where you're going to keep it and how you're going to do it. And I think that's um, also a really important one. Again, there is a gob of um, software out there and, and apps as well. So the, the bottom of this, we talk about, you know, go out to Google Play and click on sound effects, click on video editing and see what's out there. Read some of those reviews. Again, I have um, a link to something that Hub Pages did called Video Tools. It's a little bit old. Um, so some of the things don't exist anymore, but the ones that are there, it's got a really excellent description of here's what this product does, which again is really helpful if you're going out and looking for those things. Um, Pinterest actually has something called digital storytelling app sites. So another place to go and find out what is available and out there for the software that you're going to be needing. Um, I, again, I've just got a, a Visme is one, iMovie is one, We Video is one, Prezi is one, Animoto is one, Movie Maker. One of the ones that I think I have up here is called Audacity. It's free, it's open source, and it will do both um, Apple products as well as Android uh, products. So whether you, wherever it is that you've um, recorded, whether it's video or audio, you can use this one. Um, let's see, I talk, I think I talked about that one. Um, SlideShare is another one. For editing pictures, we're going to talk about editing in a second here. Um, editing Picture Manager and Photo Gallery are, are both Microsoft products that are out there. So now we're headed into the, the editing piece. So my guess is most of you don't have a just, uh, editing studio like the guy on the right has there. Um, but wouldn't that be lovely to be able to provide that for your staff and or your patrons? Um, I know there was a library that I worked with, some strategic planning, and they decided that that was going to be something they really wanted to provide at the library. So they set aside a room, they bought some editing software, they bought big monitors like these. I don't know that they've got two hooked together, but they may. And they have a room now set up where the public can come in and edit their, their audio recordings or their, um, their video recordings that they've done. So again, thinking back to some of those family things that are out there. Um, we Video was one of the best um, that I read. And again, like I said, Audacity was another good one. Difficult to use, but again, do some research on some of those. And I will have a, a little bit of that research in the, the handout, but take a look. Some of them say these are for professional editors. That may or may not be something that you want to purchase for the library. Here's one that's free, but it's really hard to use. So make the determination. Do you have the time and energy to invest into learning this? Um, if you do, great. Free is, is um, all to the good if it's got a, a really great one. The editing process is where you're going to want to add things like sound effects or other special effects. You know, we've all played with those things in PowerPoint where the 
the things can sort of fly in or they can disappear or you can layer things on top of each other. There are lots of cool special effects that you can do. And again, don't forget about special effects on your images. Do you need to um, soften it, the, the picture that's here? We've added sort of that beveled rounded corner on that picture. So there's lots of things um, that you can do in editing. So the last piece, and this is arguably where you should start, where it goes back to that intention, where do you want to publish this? Where are you going to put it to hit the audience that you're trying to hit? So think about things like Facebook. Is this a video that I want to post on Facebook? Do, do my patrons use Instagram? Is that a really big piece of your marketing? Um, if you're training, maybe Instagram isn't the right place to go. Um, maybe you have a YouTube channel at, at your library. Um, I would encourage you all to consider that. There's a the state library does now. A lot of our CE is going through our YouTube channel. Um, Vine was one of the old ones. They were those little six second um, videos that you could that you could do. So think about where is it that you're going to publish it, and then you can think again about how you want to put it together. How long is it going to be? Going back to that intent, that's really what, what you want to think about. Um, the last pieces here, let's see where I put those at. I want to talk a little bit about that copyright issue, and that is always be sure you get permission for the videos and the quotes, and that also goes to, to speak to credits. Um, on the web, and again, I'll have some links to this, there are some really good photo credit uh, forms that you can use that you can ask people to do. We will also be asking Mandy to weigh in, and what I'd like is to have one that she can help us create that we can put out there and say, here's a, here's a good one. If you're doing a video of somebody or you're, you're using their, their photo for something, here's a really good um, sort of standard that you can use for, for crediting them and making sure that you have permission to use their photo. Um, so the copyright, Creative Commons, I threw that word out a couple of times. Um, oops, I thought I had the definition of that one. Yeah, if you have something that's under a Creative Commons license, the work can be used, but it has to be in compliance with the restrictions of the owner. So the owner may say, you can use this photo that I took of the Grand Canyon, but I just want you to put my name on it. Um, some places will say you can use this, but you have to link back to my original website. Um, people who are selling other things on their website frequently use that as part of their Creative Commons. Um, public domain means there are no restrictions. There's no copyright uh, claim at all. So if you see something that has that public domain, it means you can use it and feel free to use it however you want. Um, I mentioned before royalty free, you buy that license once and you can use the 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 item after that according to whatever the license is. Fair use is another one. We have a whole hour webinar on fair use, so I'm not going to go into that here, but there are exemptions to some of the copyright thing. Be very careful if you're trying to do something under fair use. Um, Mandy has weighed in on that one a lot, and we've got information, I believe, on the website about that, as well as um, Google um, also has a YouTube uh, piece where they talk about fair use and what you can use from YouTube. And then there's something called freemusicarchive.org and they had a really good license guide that was up there. So those are just some of the places that you can go to um, get information to how do you want to publish it? Where do you get accurate copyright information and making sure that you credit? So I think that was my big piece in the middle and I think we're doing pretty well. Oops, nope, I ran a little over there. So. Bon, you tell me, are we ready to go out to Sway? Um, we can take a look at the Sway that I created. Um, in case you're not familiar with this product, this is in the Microsoft family and it is totally free as we understand it. It's been on the scene since 2015. And in the same way that I think um, you could pretty easily step into digital storytelling by replicating what the Pickering Library did with their patrons holding up their I love my library because statements and videotaping that, I think this would be another easy way to step into digital storytelling by just kind of dabbling with this product called Sway. It's, an, it's a way, as Microsoft describes it, to create interactive presentations, stories, and more 
you're you're really pulling from all of these different um, components that probably live on your computer and pushing them into one presentation um, just to see how easy it was because Microsoft describes it as really easy um, I'm always the litmus test for that so I tried putting together a sway and what I like about it is that it has a lot of movement to it if you want me to show it Becky we don't have a, a lot of time left but if you want me to show it I I will up up to you how about um, mm -hmm. what if we whip through the slides here so they can kind of get an idea of it sure. finish up and then whatever we have left at the end we can do for questions or you can go out and do it um, once we're finished sure show people because I think it's really cool I, I think you all need to see what Bonnie did and how easy it is to to do that but how about this we'll go through the slides now and then we'll tack that on at the end that sure. sound all right that's good okay yeah, so when you open Sway and you start goofing around with it, you see that what you're doing really is putting your content into these content blocks. So your Sway will start with your presentation title and then you just start adding the elements to it. And you can just skip through these next few slides because if we look at it live, you'll see, you'll see all of these things. Um, in the in the sway presentation itself so you can keep on flipping um, this is another example we wanted to uh, encourage you to go look at in your leisure this is similar to what the Pickering library did with the because statements this was a project though where the Cincinnati Public Library sent an email to their card holders they wanted to start gathering more testimonials from people who really appreciate and use the library. So at Cincinnati Public Library last September, they sent an email marketing thing to their cardholders asking for these testimonials to come back. And they were really stunned that they got back 400 responses. And the library has been using these in all sorts of ways. But one, what really, one really cool way they've used it is um, unbeknownst to each staff member, management provided the staff members with one of these testimonials that came in talking about themselves. And so they created these testimonials on placards. They gave them to the staff to read and come to find out as the staff was reading it, they realized it was about themselves. All really good customer service interactions. So it worked for both the library promotion and as a really good morale booster for the staff. Um, in this next slide, this is a website where you can lose a lot of time. I really dig this website. It's called 8millionstories.com. It is about storytelling in general, but of course, digital storytelling prevails here. And there's some, there's an article called Six Great Examples of Digital Storytelling. One of the coolest ones that I watched on this website recently is called Snowfall. And it's a true story about an avalanche in the Cascade Mountains in Washington State. So it looks, it opens and appears to be a magazine article about this story. There's, of course, the narrative and the text, but embedded into this story are video clips of the skiers who were caught up in the avalanche and who luckily survived it. There are maps that show the storm front coming in, and it was it's a lot like watching the Weather Channel, where you see all of these maps and the high and low pressure systems colliding. There were still photos of the Washington um, Cascade Mountains. So that's really cool. And if you want, again, some more examples of digital stories, 8millionstories.com. It's just a really fun website. So we are pretty much at the end here. Um, these are just a couple of the books that I wanted to, to just give you some quick visuals of here. The one in the left there, the digital, digital storytelling guidebook, 
um, is actually free. It was made for, it's, I don't know, 72 pages or something like that. It's fairly recent, 2017. It was made for um, education. Um, so it's got some some really good background information, but it talks about using it for higher ed, but just lots and lots of really good advice in there. You can see it's digital storytelling for educators, but there's some really great advice in there and it's free. You can download it from the web. Again, that will be, um, all of these will be in, in the handout. My goal at this point is to have that handout sort of organized. So we'll have a list of the books that we talked about here. Um, I also want to talk about um, the places where you can go for software. I want to talk about some of the websites for free graphics, some for the free music, some of the webinars will link to Web Junction has done a lot on, on digital storytelling and TechSoup has done a whole series of webinars on digital storytelling. So I want to link to um, some of those that you have access to that as well. And then the last piece that I think is kind of handy is there's a lot of libguides, because like I said, this became a real a big deal in higher ed. Um, there's blogs and articles, and so I will also link to those. So there's lots of, of um, information coming as we as we move along.